tricky. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, this is a true honor. I'm delighted Howard was able to join us and for us to co-organize this with uh, Minel and Sarah Jane. So first of all, uh, I'm a first-generation immigrant to this country. I arrived 34 years ago as a what we were called foreign students then, uh, international student, student today. Um, I became a citizen 12 years ago, so I'm grateful to be in this country. I'm mindful of the fact that we are unceded uh, ancestral lands of the Musqueam peoples, and I'm always uh, conscious of that simple fact. Okay, so uh, I'm the Associate Dean for Equity and uh, Diversity in uh, Faculty of Science, and what I'm going to do today is share the perspective that we've had from several years, about eight years at least, of tracking and monitoring our diversity as we uh, have, have been conceiving uh, um, uh, it, how, how we conceive it means. And I've been helped in that uh, uh, role by um, Carol Hibsjetter, who's sitting right here. Carol, put your hand up, please. Uh, strategic Initiatives Manager, who is the data person uh, in the Faculty of Science, which uh, I will be sharing with you. Okay, so I'm going to start off by focusing much of our attention on the process of how we bring faculty into the university, and then towards the end of it, sort of widen the, the, the lens a little bit. So we are guided in hiring by our, our, our strategic plan, which right in the very first strategy is about people, where we will build and sustain a global university community representative of all, including historically excluded populations. And that is codified uh, by UBC Policy 2, which keeps us consistent with uh, um, provincial uh, and federal law, and that's titled Employment Equity. The university will advance the interests of women and indigenous, disabled and racialized persons, ensure that fair and equal opportunity is afforded to all who seek employment at the university, and treat equitably all faculty and staff. So what I'm going to start, some of you have heard this talk before, so you know, if you want to tune out, come back at 11 o'clock if you're on live stream. But uh, the rest of you, I'm going to put you all on the same footing by showing you the national picture for diversity in the academy using Melinda Smith's uh, infographics. And then I'm going to show you the fact of science-wide uh, demographic and then drill down to the department level. And then the most interesting part of everything I've done, which I think people find interesting, is we have uncovered how hiring might account for some of that diversity gap. Okay, so this is Melinda Smith's infographic. We're going to start off with her analysis of the U15 or 15 research intensive universities across Canada for two different demographic groups. We're going to start off with women, all right? So we'll start off with awards. So tier two Canada research shares women made up 39% uh, in the 2018 competition. Tier ones, they dropped down to 21%. In the Canada Excellence Research Share, this was an awful year. In one year prior, there was zero, and in 2018, they somewhat fixed it with 4% women and 11.5% visible minority men. And in the Canada 150 Research Chairs, in the one-time uh, sesquicentennial anniversary, they took a hard look at the uh, gaps in CRC uh, program and uh, uh, made diversity a priority. And there you can see that women made up, uh, white women made up the majority of the group. Uh, visible minority women made up 12.5%, and visible minority men made up 4%. If you were to look at um, uh, our, 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 our women in each of the ranks within academia, starting at the undergraduate level, they make up 60%. They drop to about 56% and 46% for masters and PhDs, respectively. At the assistant professoriate, they're making up only 43%, and you can see at full professors, they drop all the way to 28%. This is the salary gap that uh, uh, Melinda has, has documented. For um, uh, white faculty, if you're male, there's the uh, gender gap between male and female, shown in blue and pink, respectively. And just about every other uh, racialized faculty group, with the exception of uh, Filipinos, you see that gender gap sustained. And so uh, Filipinos are the exception where Filipino men make less than uh, Filipino women. What does that look like? Uh, overall, this is the whole infographic. And what Melinda concluded was that the experience for women with respect to academic progress, that's in awards, salaries, progress through the ranks, are, are fundamentally different uh, from that for men. Okay? So this is available on this uh, uh, website link here. And believe me, I'll make my slides available if that's of, of interest. Melinda did something very different in 2018. She widened the lens beyond gender and asked, I'm sure the equity myth authors, one of whom is Howard Ramos here, can give you a better history of this. 
she asked a basic question of what does it look like for racialized uh, students and faculty within the, uh, uh, the academy. So visible minority Canadians make up 22% um, of the population. One, one, ter one uh, comment about terminology. So Melinda is using the term that is the federal government's preferred term for people of color, which is visible minority. In both Toronto and Vancouver, that is no longer an accurate term. Since 2016, the census shows that indigenous peoples plus racialized people are now the majority in Vancouver and Toronto. So, but we're, we're going to use that term uh, uh, variably, but the preferred term would be racialized uh, individuals. So they make up 22% of the population. In first year, they make up 40% of, of, of the student body. When you look at PhDs, they make up 31%, and when you look at professors, they make up only 21% of the, uh, the academy. I will tell you that in the Faculty of Science, we are below that average, all right? And then, of course, university presidents, we have 6.2%, one out of the 15. Guess who that is? That's our own President Ono, and prior to that, uh, 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 Dr. Gupta. All right, in terms of representation across the uh, uh, professoriate, 77% are white, 5% are South Asian, 4% are Chinese, 3% are black, Filipinos are 2.8, indigenous faculty drop to 1.4%, okay? And uh, the unemployment rate according to the CAUT by uh, 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 ethnic background and uh, for, for PhDs uh, several years after they've graduated, this is the unemployment rate, 4.4% if you're white. Uh, Chinese males have a lower uh, unemployment rate, but just about every other racialized group has a higher unemployment rate. That may reflect, sorry, uh, yes. The salary discrepancy between uh, uh, Caucasian or white faculty versus every other group is shown over here, and that may very well reflect the fact that Salary averages are highly driven by the uh, people who are the full professor rank. And so if you've got a promotion delay for any racialized group, you're going to see that reflected uh, uh, within this um, uh, statistic. And so that's the overall infographic. And what Melinda concluded was that different racialized groups experience academic progress. It's unemployment, salaries, prevalence as tenured faculty, fundamentally different uh, if you're uh, white. So I'm going to move on to... Uh, the Faculty of Science-wide data, starting with women. That's really precarious. I'm not going to risk that. <laughs> it's floppy. Okay, so this is from our annual report, and what we have plotted over here is a analysis of the gender diversity of the women uh, so faculty within the, uh, the Faculty of Science. And so what you can see is that full professors are in dark orange, they, at 2000, we were at 3% uh, women who made up full professors, and today we're at about 18%. Our assistant professors uh, in, on the, uh, uh, in the Faculty of Science have now peaked at about 37% in 2011, and they're slightly lower than that right now, 33%. Our teaching, uh, uh, research, uh, our teaching faculty have had a, uh, a significantly higher gender parity and have uh, just about approached parity uh, in our last analysis. Okay. So what I'm going to show you now is a breakdown of our gender diversity looking at um, the faculty-wide uh, metrics at the top row, but also looking at individual departments. So let me help walk you through this. So the, the faculty of science is uh, uh, on the research stream is 22% women. And what we're going to do is benchmark how we're doing relative to the uh, best metrics that we have, which is the National Science Foundation uh, uh, data on postdoctoral fellows. All right, so 39% of postdoctoral fellows across all fields of science are women. And so we're at 22%. So there's a gap there, which I'll show you in the next slide. And what we've done is asked for every individual department, what is the percentage of women within the research stream? We have the same metrics for the teaching stream, and I'll be showing that, uh, um, we'll be analyzing that data more closely uh, in, the, in the next coming months. And so what you can see is that, you know, ignoring our research institutes, which are uh, typically quite small and, and therefore highly varied, we have both the, the least diverse and the most diverse uh, faculty in these three uh, uh, institutes. You can see that of the academic departments, the, 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 the least diverse uh, departments, chemistry, physics, and mathematics at about 14%, and the most diverse uh, department is, is zoology at about 39%. What we've done is benchmark individual fields according to their respective uh, pools. So for example, 
uh, zoology has about 44% of, of postdocs that are women, and we're about 39%. So we have a pretty small gap before we're reaching what the pool is, uh, is, is, ha has available for us in terms of uh, who we can recruit from. One of the things I'll just allude to is we've color-coded this. So we've set a pretty, poor, uh, a pretty low bar where if a given department is, has met at least half of the representation in the available pool, they'll be shown in blue. Any department that is less than half of the available representation, so for the uh, interdisciplinary institutes, we've taken the average for all of science, which is 39%, and if they don't reach half that representation, they're gonna be shown in red. So just remember that coding, okay? So we plotted that gap between representation from the available pool over here. And so what you can see is to read this graph, ideally the difference between the representation in the faculty of the department with the representation in the pool should be zero. If any given unit had an equal chance at uh, a man or a woman getting a job, we should be at about the zero mark. All right? And what you can see is that if you're to the left of it, you're falling short of the mark. All right? And one other, uh, two other metrics that I would like you to keep an eye out for is if you had critical mass, you would see an actual bar so that uh, under the Privacy Act, we cannot show you percentages for any unit that has less than four for a given uh, 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 underrepresented group. And so you can see for gender, no department has less than four women, right? They all have bars up there. So that's the second point. And lastly, the color coding once again, right? If you're in blue, you're hitting more than the 50% mark of the available pool in your postdoctoral postdoctoral pool. If you're red, you're uh, not uh, at the 50% mark of the postdoctoral representation. And then here we've got green for the few units that are to the right. So statistics is, is, is more diverse than their, their available pool. So is the Institute of um, uh, IRIS. Anyone from IRIS here? Resource and environmental sustainability. Yes. And so you can see that uh, the faculty of science as a whole has a deficit compared to the available pool. And just about every other department has a de deficit, and this is not to name and shame, but to see where we can focus our attention. So I'm gonna show you in the next slide, for the first time, we asked the basic question, what is our racial diversity look like, and what's that diversity gap look like within the faculty of science? That's shown over here. So once again, the faculty of science as a whole, you remember what the uh, diversity across the U15 was? It was 21%, we at 16%. We're in red, because, and this time we're not gonna benchmark against the NSF data because that's US data and so the uh, diversity uh, differences might be, di uh, might be different based on the uh, different ethnic makeup. And what we've done instead is to benchmark against metrics from self-identification of the candidates as they apply for the position. So we have a self-identification survey that's anonymous and with a 75% rate, we have actually got a pretty good idea of who's applying for our positions. And what we can see is that 33% over the, uh, um, the course of this uh, employment equity census identified as uh, uh, racialized, and um, our, our faculty of science is at 16%, which is less than half, so it's shown in red. And for each one of these departments, you can see that there are several that have number suppressed, or NS, because there is no critical mass. There are less than four individuals who are racialized by self-identification in these departments. Our least diverse department has n no racialized individuals, perhaps one, hopefully by 2019, we'll have that one individual self-identify and then we'll get off the zero. And the most diverse department is statistics at 27%. And this is the uh, discrepancy from the representation in the department versus the candidate pool. Once again, the major point I wanna make is we now have two departments that have a uh, uh, number suppressed, actually five, sorry, the ones in blue are barely visible, so five departments where the critical mass is so low there's less than, less than uh, five individuals who are racialized, and five out of the, uh, the 12 units in science are shown in red. So our racialized diversity gap is by far greater than our diversity gap for women, which is uh, 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 an observation we didn't appreciate. And so, Individuals don't just have one identity, and so we are going to start reanalyzing our, our newest data based on intersectionality, where we're looking at both gender and race. Just as a snapshot from the 2018 equity uh, employment census, white males make up almost 61% of faculty of science, white women make up about 24%. You can see racialized women barely make 5%, and racialized men make uh, 11%. And so that together is our 16%, which is below the national average. 
So I'm just going to touch on the three other equity groups um, that we uh, uh, keep close tr uh, track of. And so we're starting off with people with disability. You can see this is our actual uh, representation for people with disability in both the research stream and the teaching stream compared to the candidate pool. And so they're in red uh, based on the fact that they're, we don't have a good metric for people with disability or the other two equity groups I'll describe in the uh, postdoctoral pool. So we're benchmarking against the Canadian general population. And so they're in red, and you can see that our candidate pool is shown over here. And so that is a, 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 a diversity gap. For uh, individual, uh, indigenous uh, uh, faculty, you can see the numbers are so low that we have had to suppress the numbers across the faculty. And this is our actual candidate pool compared to the uh, general population. And so that's shown in red because we are less than half of the uh, candidate, uh, Canadian population. And finally, uh, individuals who identify, self-identify as LG, LGBTQ+, uh, they are about 4.7% in the research stream and 13% in the teaching stream, which is on par or higher than the candidate pool as well as the Canadian general population. So this is one success story where we can see that our diversity for LGBTQ plus individuals is actually good, which raises a different question. This is just measuring diversity, which is representation. It's not the same thing as inclusion, and you can ask me about that, uh, because there are clear signs that uh, individuals in this community are still siloed and still underrepresented in, in, in different ways. Okay, and that's the gap between the uh, representation of the faculty versus the candidate pool. Shown in red are people with disabilities. This is in green, LGBTQ plus individuals and uh, Aboriginal individuals within the, the uh, faculty of science. Okay, so how does diversity gaps like these arise in academia? I'm running out of time. Uh, so that can arise from hiring, promotion and tenure and retention. And what I'm gonna do is talk a little bit about what we've uh, discovered in terms of hiring. So what I'm gonna show you now is data that we've collected over seven seasons covering 48 searches that resulted in 59 hires. Okay, so this is looking at the research stream faculty for seven years of, of, of data. And this came about from a fundamental observation in a search that had a really narrow number of candidates, three, three individuals, one of whom was an underrepresented member. And the decision making around hiring there was fundamentally flawed and we were able to catch it and, 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 and rectify it. Um, but it raised fundamental questions within our, our uh, associate dean team. And a, a paper was described to me that suggested that if you are a solitary underrepresented member on a search shortlist, so this paper claimed there was a zero chance, percent chance of you getting recruited. And we didn't feel that was accurate because we knew otherwise. We had seen data, we knew of individuals within our, our recruitment process that had been recruited. And so we said, well, we can't trust this data. It wasn't uh, peer reviewed. And we thought, let's take a look at our own data and find out what's going on. And so I'll just show you what the conclusions were and then I'll show you some of the data. So success in hiring underrepresented groups is influenced by the number of women and visible or racialized candidates on the shortlist. I'll use that abbreviation, abbreviation BR in some of the slides. So that's directly affected by, uh, uh, influenced by uh, how many candidates are on the shortlist of that underrepresented group. And then what we discovered is that how we shortlist has a gatekeeping role in our diversity gap. Okay, I'm gonna show you that data. So I'm gonna start off by showing you the data on women and racialized peoples as a whole over all those seven years, over all those 48 searches. And what I'm gonna tell you is how to read each of these three, uh, four different uh, uh, color charts. Okay? So the blue is the percentage of women in, a, in all those searches that had applied. Okay? So it's the percentage of the applicants that were women. In teal are the percentage of, of uh, people that were shortlisted who are women. And in red are the percentage of women in those seven years of hiring that got offers. And in purple are the percentage of women that got hired. All right? So what you can see is that about 21% of the applicants were women, 27% or so were uh, shortlisted, 20. 3% got offers, and about 26% got hired. All right, so that's the overall sort of progression. What we're trying to do is assess how do people do at each stage of these four steps that it takes to get finally recruited. I can't take questions, all right? Now on the right, <laughs> our racialized faculty and how they've done. So over those searches, slightly fewer searches because we don't have the metrics for racialized identity for all our searches. So you can see in blue the applicant pool 
racialized candidates made up 30 some percent of the applicants. And yet, when they got shortlisted, there was only less than 18 uh, percent got shortlisted. All right? That gap is fundamentally different from what we see for women, and we wanted to know how that arose. And so what we did, which I'll show you in the next slide, is to ask the question, how did members of these underrepresented groups fare if they were a solitary member on the search shortlist, if there were two members of that underrepresented group on a shortlist, and if there was three or more members of that underrepresented group on a shortlist, okay? So this is data, I'm a scientist, so I'll try and walk you through this. So what we did was those 48 searches got binned. On this bin is all the searches that had no women shortlisted, the ones that had one woman sh shortlisted, the ones that had two women shortlisted, and the ones that had greater than two women shortlisted. First thing I want you to notice is that over the seven years of hiring in science, 17% of the searches, one in six searches, had no women shortlisted. So just keep that in mind, all right? Second thing I want you to notice is when you look at all the searches, there were 12 searches that had only one woman shortlisted. This was their percentage in the applicant pool, about 18%. That's the percentage shortlisted. That's about 20%. That's the percentage that got offers, 20%. And that's the percentage that got hired, about 20%. So if you're a solitary woman, unlike that publication, the Chan publication, you didn't have a 0% chance of getting hired. You actually had about, you were, your chance of getting hired was about on par with your representation, okay? Once you get to search shortlist that had two or more women, you can see that your chances of getting shortlisted are actually greater than your re representation and in terms of getting offers and in terms of getting hired. And so there's a great trend where the higher the number of uh, uh, women you have on your in your candidate pool, you actually have a better chance of, uh, of, of being considered and being shortlisted and being uh, offered and hired. And here uh, on the bottom in red is the average size of each one of these search shortlists. You can see that there's a positive trend. The larger the number of candidates you interview, this is seven, a little bit more than seven candidates interviewed, you have a much greater chance of, of being recruited. The ones that had only one woman shortlisted was about five people shortlisted. Now that's typical for science, it's not typical for other faculty. What does this look like for racialized faculty? That's shown over here. So the first thing I want you to know, so these are all the searches where there were no racialized candidates uh, shortlisted, one racialized candidate shorted, shortlisted, two and more shortlisted. The first thing to note, a full third of searches in the last seven years had no racialized candidates shortlisted. So if you want to know one point at which we have that diversity gap with all those reds, with five out of 12 units that are, are showing up in red, this is the starting point. If you don't even get candidates on your short list, you don't even have a hope of landing that job, right? So we didn't know that. A full two, uh, uh, one third of our searches don't shortlist racialized candidates. The other point to note is that when you're a racialized candidate, a solitary racialized candidate on a short list, you can see the full 32% of the applicants are racialized, but only 20% of them were shortlisted. Now, we've heard uh, arguments that maybe we've seen this in, in searches, I've seen this as a chair myself, that some uh, unqualified candidates from other countries apply randomly for positions. And so I've heard the, I would say, the equity diversion, uh, that maybe that's what that represents. But that, would, that does not hold true, because when we interrogate that concept, if you were a random applicant who had no qualification for a position, you had no control over whether it would land in this bin, that bin, or that bin, right? You're a random applicant. You should have seen that discrepancy occur for any of these, uh, these bins. And what we see is, in fact, we see no evidence that there is a discrepancy between the pool of applicants for the bins that have two or more uh, uh, racialized candidates. And so what this represents is a systematic discrepancy compared to what women experience that is uh, a gatekeeping function of how the committee saw that solitary individual and chose uh, whether or not to shortlist that individual. Okay, so that's the contrast between women and the experience for a racialized faculty shown right here versus there. And you can see that once you get to two or more racialized candidates, you have this dramatic jump in terms of offer rate and uh, uh, actual hiring, which was uh, uh, much better than if you were a solitary individual. So let me just go through my conclusions. Uh, what we found was that the science professoriate largely do not reflect the candidate pool, let alone the student body. In our hiring process, the percentage of shortlists with no racialized candidates was twice that with no women candidates. A solitary female candidate will match their pool representation, but not a solitary racialized candidate. Okay. When there's more than one candidate from an underrepresented group, they exceed the representation in the pool, both in offers and hires. 
what we think is, is obvious, longer short li lists correlate with more underrepresented candidates interviewed. And what the basis for this is not clear. I mean, I'm a biomedical scientist, so I'll let my social science colleagues tell me what, what they think is going on. But the Johnson and Chan paper suggested a status quo effect. What they suggested was a solitary candidate is marked as outside the status quo, but when we create a new status quo among finalist candidates by adding just one more woman or minority candidate, decision makers actually considered hiring a woman or minority candidate. Okay, so my last two, three slides. So what am I doing uh, in this role? We're raising awareness. The gatekeeping role of search committees and chairs cannot be underestimated. We play a role in deciding who we see as fit to join us, let alone be, uh, attend a conference. How do we expand our search shortlist? So in science, we have an average of about five, but every now and then, and I, I know in other faculties, it's less than five, but we have to start the conversation because clearly, if you just interview two people or three people, you are skewing the deck against underrepresented groups, okay? So I've just learned that this, uh, what we do in science has a term, it's called a second look. I heard that from Arig al Sheba uh, over the Congress meeting. This is a process where we query searches. It's part of our process. It's part of our written recruiting guidelines that uh, search shortlists have to be approved by two as uh, associate deans. And so anytime there's a zero or one woman or a racialized candidate shortlisted, we will query where is your highest ranked woman or racialized candidate. If they're really far off, that's it. Because there's a chance that you might have zero women or racialized candidates uh, statistically. But if they're close to the cutoff, we'll ask them to consider whether we should be bringing that individual in. Uh, because what, how a person looks like on a CV is fundamentally different from how they actually perform in person. And then we also uh, frown on shortlists that are smaller than five. Uh, five is about the, the point at which we will say you should be considering a larger shortlist. Okay, so uh, the action items, the last slide, uh, in terms of policy, we are updating our recruiting guidelines with full implementation for all searches by fall 2019. The other thing that we can work on is process. We need to improve our metrics with self-identification surveys. We're trying to think about how we can get uh, better uh, coverage. And ideally, we should have a centralized job portal where in order to apply, you would actually fill out the self-identification survey. And you can say, I don't choose to disclose, but you have to fill out the survey, okay? And then culture shift. We need to build a sense of owning this and buy-in. One of the best things about what I do is I'm at the forefront. I'm not at the administrative policy level, which, which we heard from Congress, that you can design policy, but the, the implementation is what really matters. The rubber meets the road when search committees meet and decide who is in and who's not, right? And so I have the privilege of being uh, a part of that process. And so getting search committees to, to recognize their, their ownership of this and to buy into it. Widening the equity lens beyond women has a, had a tremendous beneficial effect. People now see this problem as, as, as universal, as something that we all have. We all have implicit biases and explicit biases. And then finally, uh, we are talking about a faculty-wide umbrella for EDI committee efforts. So lastly, I want to just, uh, my final thoughts, we are going to widen to intersectional analyses. Uh, diversity or representation is not inclusion. And what does inclusion for me look like? It's hiring, mentoring, and enabling without gatekeeping or exclusion. Gatekeeping is another word for exclusion, right? Participating in decision making. If you've got great diversity, LGBTQ plus individuals come to mind, but they're not involved in decision making and steering the future direction, you don't have representation or inclusion, all right? Uh, stopping the microaggressions. Feel free to ask me about that anytime. Uh, we, we've been exposed to those. And checking assumptions. Um, so I'm going to leave that by acknowledging the great people that have supported this work. So within the fact of science, the Dean, Megan Aronson, Carola Hibbs-Jetter, who you've seen, Kate Blackburn, who's assisting with this uh, whole event, sitting in the back there. I see you, Kate. Um, the Provost Office, Minal Matani and Jennifer Love are tremendous uh, 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 leaders and colleagues and friends. Uh, and I, I look to you uh, all the time, Jen, so over in the back there. And the Equity Inclusion Office, Sarah Jane Finley and Marco um, Pahalic, I think. I'm not sure I pronounced his name right. Sorry, Marco. And so I'm happy to uh, stop right there. And um, I don't think we're taking questions because we're going to do that as a group. So it's time for break. And uh, I would uh, take questions one-on-one -on -one if you need to. Okay, thank you.